Once, the southern half of Russia's Sakhalin Island was a Japanese territory called Karafto. Coal mines and paper production flourished. People migrated from all over Japan. By mid-1945, 400,000 Japanese called the territory home. But before long, Karafto came under attack from Soviet forces. Then, five days after Japan declared defeat in World War II, some 35,000 Soviet troops invaded the territory. The war was supposed to be over, but a ground battle broke out and lasted for seven days. Estimates of the casualties range from 5,000 to as high as 6,000 people. Many of the dead were civilians. They included a large number of young children. Japan had announced its intention to surrender, yet in Karafto, the fighting raged on. Local troops were ordered not to lay down their arms. Their commanders were determined to fight to the bitter end. But there weren't enough soldiers, so civilians were forced to the front line. Even so, military leaders didn't stop the fighting. Civilians had their backs to the wall. Nine young women swallowed poison and died. Family after family took their own lives. Up until now, the ground battle in Karafto has gone largely unreported. We shed light on seven tragic days following Japan's defeat in the war. World War II drew to a close, Japan doggedly pursued a losing fight against the United States and the other Allied powers. On August 9, 1945, the Soviet Union invaded Japanese-controlled Manchuria in present-day China, breaching its neutrality pact with Japan. Soviet troops on Sakhalin also crossed into Karafto and engaged Japanese troops near the border. Many of the survivors eventually settled in Hokkaido, Japan's northern island, just south of Sakhalin. <laughs> Tada Aki Yamazaki was in Karafto as a child. For much of his life, he said little about what he experienced. The Yamazaki family lived in a town in southern Karafto. Throughout the war, the fighting seemed far away. 
Then they heard the emperor's radio address announcing Japan's defeat. Yamazaki was ten years old. A scene from the public bath that day is clearly etched on his mind. あの、どうbefore long, the Soviets attacked Karafto. As planes unleashed heavy raids, Yamazaki's father tried to warn neighbors. だから Thousands of lives were lost, even after the war was declared over. We combed through historical materials in an effort to find out how and why it happened. We tracked down people who were in Karafto to get to the bottom of the tragedy. The day after the emperor announced Japan's defeat, a series of incidents began that would change Karafto's fate. On the western coast was a town called Estoru. When the Soviets arrived, Japanese troops stationed there made a preemptive strike. Three hundred of them were waiting in ambush. When Soviet troops started coming ashore, they attacked. Oh, Junji Otsuki was a private in the Japanese army. He says the Soviet soldiers who landed on the beach didn't seem poised for battle. From ships off the coast, Soviet machine guns returned fire. The truth is that Otsuki and his fellow soldiers had no idea that Japan had lost the war. A day before the emperor's radio address, a major blackout hit Estoru. Residents had no way of hearing the announcement. 
local military leaders remained silent about Japan's defeat. The soldiers were kept in the dark and forced to continue fighting. Otsuki still struggles with this fact. On that same day, the headquarters of the Imperial Japanese Army's 88th Division in Karafto received a puzzling order. The war had been declared over, but the men were told to defend Karafto to the death. The division's second-in-command, Chief of Staff Yasushi Suzuki, had already begun preparing to lay down arms. He wrote about the confusion he felt when the order came in. I cried and told the regiments to disarm. They were in tears as they complied. Then, on the afternoon of August 16th, the order arrived. I was baffled and said to myself, why now? It just didn't make sense. I called the operations chief in Sapporo, but I couldn't get a straight answer. The very same day, the Imperial General Headquarters in Tokyo told all military units to immediately halt all combat, except for self-defense. The order was given in the Emperor's name. But the 5th Area Army in Sapporo didn't relay this information to Karafto. Instead, Suzuki and other officers were told to defend the territory at all costs. The order came from the commander of the 5th Area Army, Kiichiro Higuchi. After the war, he had this to say. I was faced with the possibility that the Soviet Union might advance further and invade Hokkaido. I thought, depending on what the Soviets do, we may need to take defensive action. At that point, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin had acquired secret U.S. approval to seize Karafto and the Kuril Islands to the east. He was also seeking Washington's go-ahead for a Soviet occupation of the northern half of Hokkaido. Higuchi came up with an idea to use Karafto as a bulwark to keep the Soviets out of Hokkaido, so he gave the order to defend Karafto to the death. But the Karafto division wasn't strong enough to counter a Soviet attack, and there were no reinforcements. Not enough troops, no tanks or planes, and we don't have anti-tank or anti-aircraft weapons. At least we need more troops for defense. The order to defend Karafto at all costs came the day after Japan acknowledged defeat. Before long, the territory's residents would find themselves in a life-or-death battle. We located documents showing that civilians living in Karafto were forced to fight on the front line. Records about what happened are kept in Russian archives. This file contains reports on Japanese officials and servicemen from Karafto. They were interned in the Soviet Union after the war. Another document describes a plan to enlist civilians, even women and children, for a so-called volunteer fighting corps. The group would fight alongside soldiers at the front. 
all Japanese living in Karafuto will be used as soldiers at the front line. This is the plan. Weapons will include spears, hand grenades, and poisoned arrows. Until they die an honorable death, all will engage in guerrilla warfare. Japanese military leaders had in mind another fight when drawing up their plans. It was the Battle of Okinawa. There, civilian fighters were used to buy time until possible Allied attacks on Japan's main islands. Military leaders planned to use the same strategy nationwide. But in the end, the only place they implemented it was in Karafuto. We tracked down a man who was sent to fight on the front line as a teenager. Masanobu Kanazawa was 16 years old when he and his neighbors were enlisted in the volunteer fighting corps. Kanazawa was sent to the front in Estoru, the town where the Soviet invasion began. He'd received no training and was thrown into guerrilla warfare wearing his everyday clothes. He brought an old gun from home that his family had used to hunt bears. Soviet troops ruthlessly fired on the Japanese. あ、違う、感じね。でも感じ、これで、ね。Witnesses described seeing the bodies of civilian fighters floating in these waters. Records say in one area, 100 civilian fighters lost their lives. Guerrilla warfare hardly achieved anything. We just kept suffering casualties in vain. Somehow, Kanazawa survived. When he came to, his fellow fighters were gone. To avoid Soviet troops, he took a mountain path There, he came upon an appalling sight. Civilians who had been gunned down. They were all people who'd lost their lives trying to flee the fighting. 
Karafto stretched out over some 450 kilometers on southern Sakhalin Island. Civilians living there headed south on foot, trying to reach ports and ships that would carry them to safety. They became targets for Soviet fighter planes. An eight-year-old boy and his mother were among those trying to escape. People walked through the night to keep out of sight of the Soviet troops. Many children became exhausted and couldn't go on. ま、一番かわいそうなのはやっぱりね、子供捨てる親ですね。母親が影から落とすんですよね。血だるがいなくなっちゃって。そういう時避難っていうのは大変だったんですよね。自分の体を前へ進むだけでもって精一杯なんです
On that day, Kazuko Fujiya was waiting to flee with six members of her family. The same day, Chief of Staff Suzuki of the Karafto Division sat down at the negotiating table with the Soviets. A translator recorded the exchanges between the two sides. Civilian casualties were mounting, and Suzuki inwardly wanted a ceasefire. He made a suggestion. The war is over. Why don't we both stop fighting and conclude a ceasefire? The evacuees will travel south. The Soviets replied. Japan has surrendered unconditionally. You must disarm and turn yourselves in as prisoners. Suzuki was concerned about the safety of the residents, but he was bound by the order to defend Karafto at all costs. If you proceed southward, you'll encounter our troops and have to engage them. I would think the best course of action is to forego any further advance into our territory. The Soviets became terse. We will continue to move forward. After three hours, the negotiations broke down. The opportunity to reach a ceasefire was lost. Thirty-five hundred Soviet troops stormed into Maoka. Seeing no way out, some residents committed suicide together. Fujiya had survived the bombardment from the Soviet warships. She shared a memory she'd kept locked up all this time. It involved a family who'd been close to her own. The father, a junior high school teacher, had killed himself with a military sword. Next to him lay the bodies of his wife and children. こう壁、まあ斜めにパーッと縮むけのあとだから一等のもとだったんでないでしょうかね。順番に、あれしたわけでしょ。じゃあ次の次それ待ってる。どういう気持ちで待ってたんだろうと思うの。順番に6人の人
But they didn't move in to protect Maoka's residence. The military's priority was keeping the Soviets from entering Toyohara, where the Karafto Division's headquarters was located. They had the troops remain at the pass in ambush. Former Sergeant Yoshie Kumagai was there and received the order. ホヘイダエに従軍隊作戦命令。The residents were left to face advancing Soviet troops on their own. A former Soviet soldier recounted what happened. Other tragic scenes unfolded. Haru Matsushita was living in Maoka with her family. Soon after the Soviet invasion began, her older sister died. Haru's sister Kimi was 19 years old. She was hardworking and dependable, and Haru looked up to her. Kimi worked as a telephone operator, a dream job for a young woman at the time. The job included military and government communications. The operators were taught their work was more important than their lives. Two days before the Soviet troops landed, the family was getting ready to flee by ship. They urged Kimi to join them. But she stayed behind at the port by herself. ケケジブが残らなければ他の人もね、残らないだろう。そうすると On August 20th, with Soviet guns echoing in the background, Kimi and her colleagues got on the telephone to report what was happening. We were able to track down someone who was on the receiving end. She was a telephone operator in Toyohara, where the military division had its headquarters. Her name is Yachiko Kurita. なんか、マオカさん、何とかって言ってるうちに、え、爆撃本当なんて言ってね、本当に船が見えるんだかなんか、ロスケの上がってくるのは的に見えるんですよね。
そういうとこでしたからね「うん、もうロスケが見えますこれでさよなら」って言った。The line remained open. Yachiko began to hear groaning. 苦しいって声だけが響いててね苦しいってその声のそれでもってもあのもうなんていうか恐ろしいっていうかぞっとするかその声がね本当にもうずっと染みちゃったんだねもうとにかく飲まないでっていうのが必死だったと思います。Nine operators, including Kimi, committed suicide. They took cyanide that was kept at their office as a last resort. Before Haru left Maoka, Kimi had given her a kimono to take care of. Kimi was engaged to be married and had planned to take it with her. Haru has always thought how her sister must have wanted to live. Nigeru, Nigeru, I can't do so much. I'm not going to 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 do so much. On the day the Soviets landed, some 1,000 people in Maoka died. Toyohara, site of the Army's Karufto Division headquarters, was targeted by Soviet air raids. Ships carrying evacuees were also attacked. The number of Japanese casualties rose to more than 5,000. On August 22nd, A week after the Emperor announced Japan's surrender, both sides finally agreed on a ceasefire. Under a directive from the Imperial General Headquarters, commanders in Sapporo issued a new order. Instead of defending Karafuto to the death, local troops were told to honor an immediate ceasefire. The Karafuto Division followed the order and disarmed. This footage taken by the Soviets shows Chief of Staff Suzuki at around that time. He didn't keep Karafto from falling to the Soviets, nor was he able to prevent civilian casualties. He later wrote this Did I successfully carry out my duties? The answer, clearly, is no. Suzuki was interned in Siberia for 12 years. The Soviets went on to occupy all of Sakhalin Island. A large number of Japanese civilians were also interned for about two years. They lost both family members and possessions. And once back in Japan, they had to endure the hardships of the post war years. Masayasu Hosaka has written numerous works on Japan's 20th century history. The battle in Karafuto caused many civilian casualties even after Japan had admitted defeat. He says even now it isn't clear who is to blame. The most important thing I feel is that the most important thing is the most important thing is the most important 国民、庶民、あるいは戦闘隊に組み込まれた人たちです。この人たちが最も太平洋戦争でですね、犠牲が多い。ところが、命令を出した人、命令を出したのを受けて、それをさらにこういうふうに具体的な行動を指示した人、この辺のところの責任の方が、恐るべきほど日本は欠けている。でそれはある意味でね私たちは悲しくなるこんなことまでして戦わされた国民義勇兵
温度血栓っていうのは何なのかとそういった資料をもとにやっぱりこの責任はどこにあるのかあるいはこの史実としてこれは何を語り継ぐべきかっていうのはやらなきゃいけないですよね本当はね。The town the Japanese called Maoka is now the city of Kolmsk. In July 2017, Haru Matsushita went back for the very first time. Seventy two years had passed since she and her sister Kimi. Bid each other farewell at this port. She still can't forget how Kimi stayed behind, waving to the rest of the family, all alone. かな。会いに来てくれたと思って喜んでくれてるかな。とかね。何もどんな気持ちでね、手振ってね、別れたのかね。今出さだからじゃないですけどね。the war had supposedly ended for Japan. Its citizens were forced into battle in Karafuto. Thousands of lives were lost. Until now, these people and what they went through have largely been forgotten. The details of the tragic events remain unresolved. 